we want to just take a, a quick moment to welcome you and tell you a little bit things uh, about opensource.com. If you haven't had a chance to stop by the booth yet, I like to describe opensource.com as an online community and publication talking about and highlighting how open source is changing the world. And we like to collect your stories and we're going to tell you uh, about ways that you can contribute. Um, there are quite a few ways you can contribute. You can actually ping us on uh, any of our social networks if you have questions. You can email us at open at opensource.com. You can submit. We have a web, web form online that will ask you a few questions and help walk you through the process of drafting um, an outline idea, and it's opensource.com slash story. And you can also find us and some of our community moderators hanging out in Freenode IRC on opensource.com. So a few reasons why you should contribute. Um, we've had stories of people that have written for us that have gotten a job because of what they've written, so that's really cool. Um, you can elevate your own personal profile, grow your network. Uh, we do a lot of interview series on the site and connect you with, um, with people throughout the open source community. Uh, it's a different way to contribute back to open source. A lot of folks kind of default uh, to thinking that um, most of the contributions have to be code related. So this is a way to actually help market your projects and get some more visibility onto them. Uh, our team provides editorial services. So if, you're, if English is not your first language or if you don't feel like a strong writer, we can help improve, um, those, uh, improve your writing. A couple folks think that we're lovable. We get hugs at our booth uh, very often. And uh, we just think it's, it's really easy to write for us. So I think the biggest barrier that we see uh, with, um, with getting contributions is people just don't know that they can contribute their story. And so uh, a few quick success stories. Hopefully most of you were here yesterday to hear Jim Whitehurst, the CEO of Red Hat, talk about his book, The Open Organization. We saw a great opportunity to expand our editorial content and talk about open source and leadership. And so we have uh, launched a new section earlier this year that's talking about um, a lot of the principles uh, in, the, in the open organization. We had a community called B Code that published an article with us uh, in January of this year. And their project was basically, uh, their investors of the project weren't going to open source the code base until they hit 10,000 users. So you can see on the graph here where, they, uh, where the, we published the article and their user rate uh, skyrocketed. And so their investors actually decided to, uh, to open source the code base because they had so much momentum. Now we can't guarantee that for every single project, but here's a great example of a successful one. We're also able to cover a nice wide range of um, stories and um, contributions from people from all around the world. One story we did a couple months ago was an interview with Patricia Torvalds. Um, her father is the creator of uh, Linux, in case you have it. you're not familiar with Linus Torvalds. Um, but she just graduated from high school recently. She's attending Duke. And we sent her an interview, and um, it was really interesting to see her answers because as a high schooler, she gave us some um, perspective on what's actually working that we don't hear about sometimes. For example, in her interview, she told us that um, being acknowledged in high school and getting an award for some computing science project that she did and then having access to a network of other women in tech had really worked well for her. And then to follow up for that story, I have been to several events since then where attendees, I've overheard them talking or they've come up to me and said how inspiring it was to see the next generation, um, you know, testifying that, that these things that we're doing that we never hear the results of are actually working. And uh, so this is one of the many success stories you'll find on our site, and we'd like to hear more of yours also. Um, so that's all we have for you today. I just want to mention that um, in addition to the send-off social at Box Boxcar this evening, we will have an opensource.com meetup there starting at 9 p.m. So come on over. Uh, we'll have some game tokens and uh, maybe a few extra t-shirts. So thank you, and enjoy the rest of the lightning talks. Thank you. Thank you, Ricky and Jason. So, we're about to get started, folks. Seatbelt sign is lit. Go ahead and uh, sit back and get ready. The first person that I want to introduce is Daniel Farrell, uh, who is going to be talking about um, Introduction to Vagrant. You got five minutes. Hello, everyone. Plus one to the seatbelts. We're going to be moving quickly. Can we get our slides? Okay, my name is Daniel Farrell. I work for Red Hat under the R&D office on the SDN team. Uh, I'm DeepRail07 everywhere. Uh, I need to find my clicker. Which brings me to, I just tweeted out these slides, so if you want to find those, that's how you would do it, D-F-A-R-R-E-L-L-07. Um, so what's Vagrant? Jumping in, we have very little time. 
quickest way I can put it, simplest way I can put it, is that it's a tool for working with virtual machines. In fact, it's a modular framework for working with virtual machines, which we'll see more of in a second. Um, it all starts with a Vagrant file, and it's kind of all orchestrated through that Vagrant file, so that can be very simple. You'll see more examples in a second. And then very simple commands, so Vagrant up, Vagrant SSH, and then we have a shell. Um, that's cool, but we've been able to work with, or with uh, virtual machines through the CLI for a long time. So VBox manage, create VM, we could wrap scripts around this and have similar functionality. Um, per a very nice rant that uh, Mitchell went and did on Hacker News for us, we have some insight into sort of the harder problems that they solved uh, with Vagrant, it, you know, on top of what could be done with shell scripts. A lot of that is around cross OS support. So Vagrant is a cross OS platform. You can use it with OS X or Windows or various Linux distributions. Um, it also does a lot of networking out of the box for you. So as soon as you stand up your VM, all of your network's working, and that's cross OS. It also does a lot of synced directory work for you. So the directory that contains your Vagrant file automatically gets synced into your box and vice versa. Here I'm showing the contents of root Vagrant, and then I'm creating a new file, uh, root Vagrant foo, and then I'm logging out of the VM and showing that it's been synced uh, back to my local system. Um, finally, it solves all of these problems in a modular way, which we'll show in a second, which would be very difficult for shell scripts. Um, so here's a really important concept, Zolna and difficult thing. There are two really important P words here in Vagrant world, provisioners and providers. Provisioners and providers, provisioners and providers, key concepts. Um, jumping in, provisioners, or sorry, providers provide virtualization support. Essentially they magic VMs into existence. There are two types of providers, local and remote. Uh, local providers are things like VirtualBox, Libvirt, uh, VMware, Docker. Yes, Docker, so you can manage containers, not just virtual machines. When I said it's a VM management tool, there was a slight white lie there. Um, also, remote providers, things like OpenStack, DigitalOcean, AWS. Um, second major P word, provisioners. Provisioners provision the VM, or they do shared repeatable configuration against the VM. Um, there's some simple on-ramp provisioners, like the shell provisioner. You can do just inline commands. You can point at shell scripts. Nice little uh, way to get started. There are also powerful options for people who need things like that. So Ansible roles, Puppet, um, Puppet uh, Chefs, all Puppet modules. Um, you can mix and match. As a Vagrant practitioner, you would then go and mix and match uh, provisioners and providers based on the knowledge that you have to sort of solve the use case that you need. Let's see that through some examples. Here's kind of the most minimal example. We're saying vagrant init m, the name of the box that creates the file that we're catting out in the second command here. Um, the file says that we want to start with a fresh CentOS 7 environment and do no additional configuration. We can then uh, boot this virtual machine with vagrant up. That downloads our base box if we don't have it cached locally already. It boots the VM and it does our cross OS networking and sh synced folder magic. We can then connect with vagrant SSH and huzzah, we have a shell on our new machine. Uh, second example, quickly. This uses the shell provisioner. So we have the similar configuration on the first line. In this case, we're starting from a Fedora 22 box. And then we're saying we want to run this inline shell command, which in this, our case installs some system dependencies using DNF. We can boot our box with Vagrant up again. We do the same networking and shared directory magic. And then we run our shell provisioner, which will install those system dependencies, as we'd expect. Third example, this one uses Ansible. So first line, similar. We're starting with a Vagrant base box that's uh, Fedora 22. Second chunk is the con configuration for the Ansible provisioner. Basically what's going on is that we're pointing out a playbook file, which is kind of an Ansible thing that you don't really need to understand, but it's pretty simple. We're saying for all host, as root, install open daylight, which is a project that I contribute to, and accept all the defaults. Uh, when we do our vagrant up, we do the same magic around networking and such, and then we run our Ansible provisioner that installs open daylight. We can connect to our box with Vagrant SSH and then use sudo system control as active open daylight to verify that our open daylight systemd service is running. So concluding with some sort of high level points about why I think you should use Vagrant, why it's an awesome tool, it provides well-defined environments that you understand, right? So you know what you installed, you know what's configured in this environment, you can go back and reference that easily. Um, it's also easy to share those environments with your team members. Now, this can be like your individual team members in a company, particularly powerful for open source communities though, I will attest, as we use it all the time in the upstream. Um, the Vagrant file that sort of defines all of this is done is in version control, so there's lots of benefits around that, looking at the history, uh, the contributions, going back in time, um, being able to review code as it's changing and such. It also replaces binary VM artifacts, which is sort of the traditional thing that we're switching out here. So VM, VM blobs have issues around figuring out what software is installed in them um, and copyright things that follow from that. So this is a nice win for open source projects as well. Your environment and code ship together. So when you git pull your repository, you also get the Vagrant file that defines the environment of how to run it. Um, you're able to reuse existing logic around configuration management. So if you have a complicated project that you've solved 
the deployment with an Ansible role or something, you cannot duplicate that effort and just consume it in Vagrant. Your local deploys and your remote deploys look very similar. So if you're a dev working on software on your local box and, you're an, and you have an ops person as well, their deployment pipeline will look very similar to stand up <coughs> tens of these pieces of software in production. That's all I have and I'm out of time. My name's Daniel Farrell again, dfarrell 7 everywhere. Thank you for your time. Well done. That was impressive, thank you very much. So uh, I'd like to introduce now Jen Krieger, who's gonna be talking about uh, common misconceptions using Agile in open source. Hi everybody, I'm Jen Krieger and I'm an Agile coach at Red Hat working with the teams developing Project Atomic and OpenShift. Earlier this year, Fedora project leader Matt Miller asked me if I would go to Brno and do an Agile talk for DevConf. My talk went through a few durations, but it winded up somewhere in the space of how Project Atomic was delivering software uh, using Agile principles and practices. I worked really hard on that talk, and I thought I did an excellent job. However, when I returned to the States a few weeks later, I received what I classify as the most epic conference feedback ever. Your talk was poop. I was dismayed, but in reality, it solidified a thought that I had for a while, which I think is a large problem with the way that we talk about Agile, which technically is exactly that, the way we talk about Agile. Agiles have failed to deliver the message in a way that the open source community understands, because let's face it, the current market for Agile is essentially an executive or a manager looking to purchase training to help, uh, help their teams solve their problems. So I'm here to give you today a five minute rundown of how we can get around the marketing of Agile and to get to the truth of what it really is intended to be. And the way I like to have this conversation is simple. I'm gonna talk about four things that I have heard recently at Red Hat. And if you notice somebody blushing in the audience, chances are it's that person who said it. <laughs> Agile has two week sprints that would never work in an open source community. Agile is not Scrum. Scrum is about two week sprints, but it doesn't always have to be what you use. Um, in fact, Scrum is one of 40 plus methods that suggest how people could work together. Um, however, XP, Kanban, Scaled Agile Framework, Lean, uh, Large Scale Scrum, Spotify Squatification Method, DevOps, these are all things that are aligned with Agile, and they kind of suggest how you can be Agile. Um, however, I'm hoping the majority of you have, uh, on, you know, maybe heard release early, release often, which was a, a philosophy that was popularized by Eric Raymond um, via his essay, The Cathedral and the Bazaar, Bazaar. It was basically published around 1997, which was largely written based on observations of how the Linux kernel, uh, kernel community worked. Um, and although I don't think the original signers of the Agile Manifesto uh, you know, stole from open source, I think the intention and spirit behind it was actually very similar. Agile is all about speed, forget design, quality, security, and documentation. Agile is not always about speed, but it is about fast feedback loops. So whatever method you choose, the intention behind the implementation is that you get feedback, and basically on what you're working on, the code you're writing as soon as possible. Great Agilists know that the way to get feedback is to have version control in place, continuous integration, delivery, automated testing, you name it. Similar to the way that open source communities could potentially use GitHub and Jenkins to provide feedback on a PR that is potentially going to merge. Agile only allows for one person to define the product requirements, the product owner. So who is this mysterious product owner anyway? The product owner is a role that is basically defined within the concept of Scrum. Basically, this person is responsible to help guide the development teams to make sure they stay on track, and generally they work with a product manager who understands the market or understands where the product needs to go. Consider the concept of a product owner very similar to a core maintainer within an open source community. Core maintainers are generally somebody who's going to review code, provide comments, or eventually merge functionality that is intuitive or respectful of what it is they want their project to do. So I would say while the name is maybe new to some of you, it's not a concept that is actually new at all. It's probably something that you're already doing. Agile requires people to be in the same place. I get the impression that when we talk about co-located teams, everyone is thinking that it looks something like this. Uh, I assure you, having everyone <laughs> close helps with communication, but it's not 100% necessary in terms of doing Agile. 
It's just one of those things that makes things a little bit easier. And I would argue that open source community already knows that true because the evidence is here in this room. Conferences like All Things Open bring community members together to help us make that face-to-face -face, uh, relationship before scattering off to the wind and using old school forms of <laughs> communication that we're used to using. And so while many agile trainers um, are all about having teams in one place, and they say that's pretty much the only way to do it, I would say be aware of what your community needs to be successful and adjust the way that you're doing to bend around those needs. And please don't balk because someone said the term agile to you and you were like, eh. Instead think, agile just forked the open source community and used it to, used to create software and added a little bit more code to it. Thank you. All right, so moving right along, our next speaker is uh, Stephen J. Vaughn Nichols, who's going to be talking about Linux through the eyes of a journalist. Hello, hello. Ah, we do have power. Hi, my name is Stephen J. Vaughn Nichols. I write about this stuff. <gasps> wow, there I am in my old office. I have a much nicer office now. So how does someone with a liberal arts degree and who, you know, I'm an English and history guy, how does someone like me end up in Linux? Well, I'll tell you how. Once upon a time, there I was, a newly minute PhD in history with all those job offers just pouring into me. Jeez, what could I just do? Well, I'll tell you what I could do. I discovered that I could read, good scale reading, don't you think? I could write, and I could do research. I also discovered, and this I did not know, I'm one of those people who I just get computers. So, so the little clicker doesn't work. <laughs> little clicker, ah, there we go. And so there I was. I could get computers, I could read, I could write. I actually ended up in, guess what, computer science and in technology. And I started out actually working with IBM 360 mainframes. My first language was IBM 360 assembler. You don't want that to be your first language. <laughs> you really don't. And then I found a PDP-1170. I wonder what was running on that PDP-1170. Come on, folks, you should know this. Basic history, Unix, that's right. And I thought, geez, this is good stuff. I can use this. And so I started picking up Unix. And now I discovered that technology still doesn't work. Aha, there we go. And from there, I discovered you know what? I like this enough, I want it on a desktop. Say hi to my first Unix desktop. Anyone, anyone else here use this thing? Yeah. It ran System 5 release 3.2 Unix back in the day, and that's where I picked up that. And it was nifty, and it was neat, and it got me thinking, I can also, besides speaking C, I could speak English. That's a rare combination. And so it was, I started writing about this stuff. First, just to other technology people, and then I discovered I could translate from C to English to people who think that C is a letter in the alphabet between B and D, and that's all they know. And so it was that I started working on things like Open Desktop. Anyone here used to work with that one? Good old open desktop, also known as open death trap, because once you were in it, terrible things could happen to you. Terrible, terrible things. And at the time, though, there were other people who were doing things on the shell level, and goodness knows I know shell, and I remember when the big user interface space were between C and born shell, and then eventually something called born again shell. And so I was doing all this, and I was starting to write about it and making a living at it. And then along came this thing called Linux. 
And I remember back uh, when, gosh, I forget what year it is now, but we're about going on 25 years of Linux. We're getting close to that. And I discovered that Linux was actually neat, that this little Finnish graduate student with a really funny name on the Minix News Group was on to something. And so I started working with Linux, starting with the release 0.03, which Linux will tell you was the first one that really worked. And so it is, I took my background of liberal arts, reading, writing, and research, added to it my ability to do interesting things with computers, and on top of that, I added what I think, and I think most of us in this room would agree, is still the most powerful operating system today as it gets near to its age, of tw gets, gets near to its first quarter century. And that's how it is that someone who really studied East African diplomatic history and English Renaissance drama, and I'm not making that up, ended up making a living about writing about Linux and using Linux because it's not just for technical people, it's not just for engineers, it's also for people like me who just really like great operating systems and great tools. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Stephen. All right, moving along quickly. Our next speaker is going to be the inestimable Jamie Duncan, who's going to be talking about gleaming the cube. Jamie? Hey, everybody. How you doing? All right, so you can take your seatbelts off. I've got like five slides. So first and foremost, the important question I have to ask, who gets the joke? You know one? No one has ever seen Christian Slater's epic Gleaming the Cube. All right, well, that's lost on all of you, and I feel bad about that. So a couple of months ago, I guess it was a couple of months ago, I was down at the Red Hat user group down near the Red Hat Tower, and Jason Hibbett says, hey, do you want to come talk about Kubernetes in five minutes? And I laughed, and I said, no, you can't do that. That's just quite simply impossible. So, okay, cool, I'll do that. So <laughs> me not being a very smart man. So you can't do how Kubernetes in five minutes. We can talk about it being written in Go, and we can talk about it being a Google project, and we can talk about etcd, and we can talk about all the other components and bits and stuff, and I'll run out of time way before we get to anything meaningful. But the one point I can make in five minutes, at least I hope I can try to make in five minutes, we can know why Kubernetes. I mean, Kubernetes is a tool that exists. It's part of Atomic. It's part of CoreOS. It's part of most, most modern application-centric or most modern container-centric tools out there. Why? Why, do, why? why does it exist? Well, and, and I, this next slide, this is the one that I hope gets uh, the Docker guy not to want to beat me up. But containers are really just kernel parlor tricks. And I say that, and I, and I say that earnestly, but I say that to try to make the point. What containers are, are things that live only inside the kernel. They only live inside the Linux kernel. That's the only place they exist. Uh, if you were at Thomas's uh, container and security talk, or if you were at the Core OS talk yesterday, you had a really good, a really good introduction into what containers are. Containers are kernel control groups. Containers are SE Linux, and containers are kernel namespaces. So, if they're everything that a container is is inside the kernel, how does it know when I want my application to span? three servers or three data centers or three planets or whatever, how does it know what's past that? And the answer is it doesn't. Containers only exist inside the kernel. That's it. So to have, to, to be able to scale out a modern, highly resilient, all of those fun buzzwords application, we have to have Kubernetes. We have to have a tool that will take my kernel and take four other kernels or 40 other kernels and glue them all together and let me see them as one abstracted out whole. That's what it does, and, that's, and the rest of it is bits, and, and they're fun bits that I wish I could get into. We could, I have two minutes and 19 seconds left, so we're not gonna be able to do that. So kernel containers are awesome kernel parlor tricks. They really are. So, um, the Core S guy's not here today, is he? Did he leave? Because if, good, because he's probably gonna wanna beat me up after I say that. <laughs> so what Kubernetes does do 
is it takes all of those kernel constructs and it lets you make the highly available apps and do all sorts of fun things. And that's what it's there for. So I guess in, if I had a summary, and I really don't have a summary, that, um, but in the how, we can't get into, but the why, Kubernetes is one of the most important tools out there, I think, today. Um, containers are parlor tricks, but they're also revolutionizing the data center. Containers are changing how we think about technology, and I'm not gonna say DevOps, but I'll go ahead and say DevOps. They're really making us rethink. You know, there is a new mode to IT, and the, the whole bimodal thing, people kind of cringe, and, and, and especially in this room, probably people cringe a lot. But it, it's making us rethink how we do software, and it's making us rethink how we deliver software. So we have to have a tool that's gonna get out there and let us, let us make that next step, and that's what Kubernetes is. I think it's a really good, I think it's a really good start to it. So, so that's the point I wanted to come up and make, that we have to have Kubernetes because we have to have containers, and containers can't think outside the kernel. And that's what I've got, I have 50 seconds left. I wish we could have questions, but if anyone wants to rough me up, I'll be outside. <laughs> Thanks. All right, thank you, Jamie. That was fantastic. So moving along, I want to introduce to you Sarah Khan, who's going to talk about five ways to make a more inclusive event. Thank you. All right, is this mic working? Yes. All right, I'm Sarah Khan. I am a co-leader of our local chapter of Girl Develop It. Girl Develop It is a national nonprofit that provides um, technical education for women. We do coding classes, we do social networking events, um, we try to connect women with jobs and technology. And we get a lot of email. Let me see if the clicker works. There we go, okay. Um, so one of the questions that we get asked a lot is, how do we get more women to come to our events? And uh, the thing about that is, women aren't a monolithic group, women are people. And they have different reasons for doing what they choose to do or not to do. Um, but pretty much the only thing we can do is encourage them. If you want more women to come to your event, make it friendly. Um, and so I'm going to go over five things that I've learned in the, my two years being a co-leader. They've worked pretty well for us, and hopefully they could work for you too. Okay, so the first thing, this seems like it should be common sense um, to make sure that your event is in, a, in an accessible space, but with tech meetups, sometimes they're in old conference rooms and upstairs and places that are strange or hard to get to. And accessibility also um, includes digital spaces. It includes um, things like letting people know that they can opt out of having their picture taken and posted. In the case of women, maybe they have an abusive ex they're trying to hide from. Um, make sure that, basically just make sure that people understand that you're open to um, meeting their needs and that you value their participation so that they don't just quietly opt out and never tell you that it was a problem. Going along with that, um, I want to give kudos to All Things Open for having such a prominent and excellent code of conduct. Basically, having a code of conduct just says, this is the community that we are, these are our values, and we will enforce them and um, that can encourage people to come participate. Another thing you can do is to branch out beyond the usual suspects. As tech people, it's really easy to think that once you've posted something on Twitter, everybody knows about it, and that's not necessarily the case. Um, for Girl Develop It, we've had great success in reaching um, underserved communities, and we've done things like um, partner with community colleges and post to uh, library bulletin boards, and there are people who still read paper and print media, so just try to think outside the box and reach out beyond um, the easy, easy usual suspects kinds of things. And going along with that, build a network with uh, community organizations and organizations outside of technology. Um, reach out to community colleges and places where people who are trying to come into technology through a non-traditional path may be coming from. And they, um, there are people out there who have grant money, who have a stated goal to get people into tech, and there's kind of a, there can be kind of a disconnect between the tech community and people in traditional education who are trying to get people into technology. So finding ways to bridge that gap is really helpful. And last but not least, um, studies have shown, I don't have the 
citation for the exact study, but I know that a study was done, that um, if you invite somebody to come back or to come participate in your event, they're more likely to come and do it. Go figure. Um, I know that I personally have um, attended events in the past where I may have felt a little out of place, but when somebody from leadership reached out to me and said, hey, we noticed you were there and we were happy to see you, we'd like to see you come back. Then I thought, oh, okay, well, I belong here. I can come back. It seems really simple, but it works. And I'm running a little early, so that's good. We'll get some time back. Um, Girl Develop It, um, we have a booth downstairs. We'd love to chat about this stuff. Um, you can find us on Twitter. You can email the leaders at rdu at girldevelopit.com. And we run all our events on Meetup. So if you want to get a list of classes and events that we have coming up, find us on Meetup. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. All right, moving along, our next speaker is from uh, uh, Penn Manor, sorry, brain cramp. Penn Manor, Charlie Reisinger is gonna talk about uh, rewiring Generation Z. Thank you. All right, let's see how my karma is today with the clicker. Oops, slides, oh no, there we go. Cool, okay, great. So ladies and gentlemen, I need to bust a myth about students these days. It's the myth that Generation Z, it's that generation after the millennials, it's the myth that they're digital natives, that these kids somehow have these great computing skills directly wired into their synapses from birth. Here's the truth though. For all of the time that these kids spend on technology, they're really not that great at computers. And it's strange though, because there's this wildly popular digital native myth, right? These kids, these kids are glued to their gadgets 24 seven. And all that social media and that gaming skill must be translating into great computer skills, right? But the truth is, is that as their devices become more simplified and in many ways sealed, our kids are becoming further and further disconnected from understanding the art and the science of computing. Now I've watched their skills disappear for the past several years. But it really struck me this past August when I was working with a group of incoming seventh graders, digital natives who were having trouble figuring out how to take a file and save it into their home directory. Some of them had no concept of what a file type was, and a few of them were having trouble with closing and opening windows. Now, unfortunately, these low technology skills are not just unique to my school district. The research is telling us that across the country, kids are losing their computer skills. And school board practices amplify this problem. As schools are purchasing tablets instead of computers and simultaneously cutting the budget for elective computer science and technology classes, we're left with a generation that is a tablet and screen tapping generation that is never learning to unlock the true power of technology. So I think we need to do better for our kids. And here's how we're changing that story at Penn Manor School District. We've launched a unique one-to-one -one laptop computer program. Every kid in grades seven through 12 receives a laptop loaded with Linux and open source software exclusively. And our kids are trusted with root access on those laptops. That's 2,500 kids unpowered with an unrestrained and unlocked full computing device. Now these laptops are daily instructional companions in the classroom, but with that trust and that openness, we're finding their learning is exploding in ways we never expected. For example, when we first rolled out the program, our kids immediately took to figuring out how to get Spotify running and Netflix playing inside Linux. Now two years ago, you know, <laughs> this wasn't so easily done, right? It was the first time that many of our kids had to get down and gritty with the command line and figure out how to get Netflix working. There was no app install. They had to take a little expedition into a terminal for the first time. And we're seeing all kinds of little surprises. For example, kids experimenting with alternative desktop environments, which is really cool to see. But there's something else really cool that's happening that people didn't expect. We've had zero discipline issues with giving our kids root access. To support this entire project, we've created a unique help desk program. This is a high school course where 21 student apprentices are working side by side with my IT team and I. These kids are providing peer support for their fellow students. 
they're resolving tickets, they're writing documentation, they're getting out into classrooms and providing training. They're building excellent IT skills, but more importantly, they're learning how to build a community of tech support for their peers. And there's one other key factor in this program. We don't exclude students based on their rock star technology skills. This course is open to every student, no matter their level of technical expertise. The course prerequisite for our help desk is curiosity. Now again, many of the digital natives are finding they can do this. And for many of them, it's the first time that they've ever thrown together a shell script or replaced a logic board. For some of them, it's the first time they ever held a, solder, a soldering iron in their hand. And I think it's these first moments, these first learning moments that to me are so magical and so transformative for our kids. I love to watch when a student realizes for the first time that she can use technology to do her bidding, that she can control the technology, she can use it to rewire her universe. But I think there's a question that we need to wrestle with, and school boards and schools need to wrestle with, and it's very simple. And that question is, which side of the command line should our kids be on? Do we pre-wire the learning environments and ask our kids to learn inside a sandbox? Or do we embrace open and give our, kill, our, our kids the skills to rewire and change the universe? Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. I always love listening to him speak. Sorry about the brain cramp earlier. Um, so our last speaker is the inestimable Jono Bacon. Jono, come on up and talk about hacking humans. Hello, everyone. I'm terrified about getting through this in five minutes, so I'm going to be a bit quick. Um, all right, so um, as many of you know, I'm very passionate about this community and figuring out how we can build strong, inclusive, effective communities that build really cool things. One of the things I've learned over the time is that it's really complicated and it's a mixture of, 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 of people and process and technology and all this kind of stuff. A while ago, my best friend, um, this guy called Stuart Langridge, who lives in England, was visiting uh, my wife and I in California and he showed me a TED talk by this guy. It's called Rory Sutherland. He is the most English person on the internet you will ever see. Um, he basically works in advertising uh, and he talks about behavioral economics. Jim Whitehurst talked about this the other day. And this is essentially um, the, the science of how we study irrational people and how they behave. The problem with economists is that they believe that everything can be put into a spreadsheet and that's not the way we tend to work as human beings. So behavioral economics is essentially how do people really work? How do they, how do they think and, and how do we study that? So I thought this was really interesting because it effectively provides a scaffolding, a science-backed scaffolding for how we can actually build communities instead of the kind of figure it out and try to figure out best practice that I've been doing for most of my career. So what's interesting here is that we've all got one of these, varying sizes and different people. Um, and within our brain, we have two types of thinking. And the first type is called system one. This is basically immediate gut reaction to something. One plus one, two, immediate. System two thinking is essentially more thought out processes. So if you're gonna buy a car, what's gonna be the right balance of features and, and, and lifetime and all the rest of it. And what's interesting is that system two is kind of like the press office for system one. It's the, we, we often react just immediately to various things and in, in system one. And behavioral economics is figuring out how we naturally react to things and then using that as a means to ba base decisions. So within behavioral economics, I believe there's basically three things you want to do. The first thing is understand irrationality, and there's actually a lot of common things that we do when we're as, as irrational human beings. So what are the things that we tend to do? How do we, be, how do we act, react to various stimulus? The second thing is behavioral economics is fundamentally about building a choice architecture. It's saying, I want to get from here to here, and you might want to give people a bunch of different options that all will get to essentially the same point. And then what we do is we build interfaces, tools, and processes that, in, that essentially build that choice architecture that helps irrational people to get into the right direction. The problem with this is with behavioral economics is that it's fascinating, but it's very difficult to figure out how to actually apply it to real things. So I discovered this guy, Dr. David Rock. He's a brain scientist, and he's done a bunch of experiments with animals, and he came up with something called the SCARF model, which are five really practical things that you can do to actually um, 
bring behavioral economics into communities. So I'm going to quickly run through this. Um, he actually published a full report on this that's pretty heavy, but it's really interesting. First thing is status. This is all system one thinking. As human beings, we really care about status. We care about, um, about our position in the group. And any ambiguity in terms of status is unsettling for us. So helping people to really understand where they fit, we often see this with developers and committers and recognizing people who are actually part of a community as opposed to people who are just fans of a community. To clarify that relative importance. The second piece is certainty. Um, system one thinking gets freaked out by insecurity and things that aren't particularly predictable. This is why when there's big significant changes at work, uh, the company gets kind of weirded out by things. So we have to plan for certainty and actively make sure that people don't have that level, level of ambiguity. The third thing is autonomy. And this is about choice architecture. As human beings, we inherently like choice. Um, when, we do, when we feel like our choices are removed, so imagine you join a company and you don't really have a lot of input in the direction of the company, we find that frustrating. So we need to put choices in place and build that choice architecture. But also, we can structure that, like I say, so you can get uh, predictable outcomes out of that. So even if all three choices get you to the position you want that person to be in, make sure you provide them with choices. The other thing is relatedness, is that social groupings are really important. And this is all about scope. So there's a lot of people in this room, and we're kind of divided up into little different groups, some people with different projects or, or whatever else. And that relatedness is important for not only getting to know people, but also making people feel part of something that's, uh, that's bigger than them. And what was really interesting was the final one, fairness. Uh, Dr. Rock did some interesting experiments with monkeys that identified that not only do we want fairness for us, every one of us in this room wants to be treated fairly, but we also want fairness for other people as well. So when you see acts of unfairness, it, we find that frustrating. Um, so that's the SCARF model. I encourage you to go and check it out. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Jonah. Well, that brings us to the end of the lightning talks. And I just, I, I observe, I, I thought about something when we were wrapping up. I love the fact that at these sessions, it's, it's all about, I want to talk to you about how to be helpful and how to be of service and how to make people more successful. I am honored to have been invited to be in front of you. I'm honored to be in your presence. I'm incredibly honored to share the stage with these speakers. Can we please give a big round of applause for all of the speakers? Thank you very much for being here and enjoy the rest of the conference.